All right, seniors, well, on to our next famous poet from this time period that none of you have ever heard of. Uh, we're going to be tackling Ben Johnson today, uh, and really with Johnson's poetry, you're in for probably, for the average high school student, a better time than you had with John Donne. Donne's tough. Donne's difficult. The metaphysical element of his poetry is always really tough on students. So um, Ben Johnson, on the other hand, at least the three poems we're going to look at today, revolve around more a more palatable type of writing for most of you, and this is lyrical poetry. And lyrical poetry is poetry that you know, right now when I say that, you're thinking about like song lyrics, and that's really the same element here. Lyrical poetry, and if you look on your book on page 494, this, a lyric is a brief melodic poem expressing personal thoughts or feelings. And that's what we're dealing with here. That's what these poems do. Uh, that's what a song does. It's conveying a thought or a feeling, and it's putting it into words, usually somewhat musical. So, you know, in a song, you have literal music. In these types of poems, it, it's taken through the rhythm and the rhyme, typically. Um, but uh, usually not too hard. I mean, these are a little more difficult than maybe if you were writing lyrics in, for a song because this is older. I mean, we're looking at Johnson lived in the late 16th, early 17th century, so the wording here is going to be problematic at times, okay? But typically they're shorter, and that helps too, okay? So let's go over and look at page 497. We're going to tackle the first. The first two of these are very easy. The third poem, um, the way I've interpreted it, may not be correct, to be honest with you, but again, I have an issue with immediately assuming that there's only one way to read a poem, all right? So, but that's to come. Let's look at the first two, which I know I've got down. Our first one's a very short 12-line poem. Um, you can tell by the imagery that the book chose to use. This is not going to be a happy poem. It's called On My First Son, and it's technically an epigram, okay? So the guy's going to be writing about the death of his first son. We know that if you couldn't figure that out from the picture of a tombstone they put there, then, you know, you, you, you've got some, some work to do, all right? <laughs> But uh, let's look at what he has to say. I'm not going to read the whole poem. It's very short. I could read the whole thing and then go back and talk about it. But uh, I'm probably going to break it up into – there's 12 lines, so let's look at the, each of the four. They're all one stanza. These aren't broken up, but really I'd like to take it slow with you, okay? So he says, Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years thou weren't lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate, on the just day. All right. So right away, you feel that lyrical bounce to it, uh, uh, you know, the, the rhythm that fits, and it's a little bit almost song-like quality. Um, you have that basic A, B, A, B rhyme scheme, which is really common and is really, really effective, okay? So right away, away we get that his child is seven when he died. Now, in this time period, the death of a child was, you know, sadly all too common. But a lot of the time, it would have been when they were very young, when they were babies and things, because babies are just so helpless in so many ways, and there were so many things that could go wrong. There's so many things that can go wrong today, let alone back in this time period. So the problem is, is that his son lived seven years. So, um, you know, it's enough time to really bond with this child and to really make a connection, and then to, uh, you know, have something tragic happen and lose them it makes it even harder. Um, he points out that his sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. In other words, to me, that means that he, you know, loved this this kid too much. It was his sin, which obviously is not a sin to love your children. But he presents it almost as, you know, he, uh, this child became the most important thing in his life, and then it was taken from him because of that is his suggestion. We'll get at the end a little bit different view of this, all right? But he obviously indicates that, uh, you know, he loved this child a lot, and then to lose it is just is just tragic on, a, you know, a level I can't understand. Then he says, oh, could I lose all father now? For why will man lament the state he should envy? To have so soon escaped worlds and flesh's rage, and if no other misery, yet age. So now he points out that um, he doesn't think he even deserves to be called a father because, you know, he shouldn't be upset about the death of this child, which, you know, that seems ironic. But really what he's pointing out is that his kid at this point has escaped all of the problems that come with growing older. Um, you know, he's been able to live in that little window of childhood where, you know, I assume with, you know, the, considering the parent he had in the situation, you know, a fairly happy childhood. And he's like, now he gets to avoid, if nothing else, getting old, but he gets to avoid all the other things that come with it, too. He says, you know, I should actually envy him, not be, uh, you know, regretful here. So he's like, you know, why? You know, it's me that's upset. My child is in a better place, having a better situation, and I should be happy for him, but I'm not. So he's upset with himself. It says, rest in soft peace, and ask, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry. 
for whose sake henceforth all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. Very clever wording at the ending, which is also a key thing in an epigram and also in lyrical poetry frequently. So at the end, you get this idea that he's like, you know, saying goodbye to his child and he calls it his, calls his boy his best piece of poetry. Knowing Ben Johnson's ego and how much he thought he was just a God's gift of writing, this is, an, this is a big statement coming from him saying that the best thing I ever created was not my poetry, it was my child. And that's really impressive. Um, and then he ends with a you know, prayer that we never become too attached to something because when you lose it, it hurts. Uh, really sad poem. Um, very sad. You can feel the passion in this. Again, lyrical poetry needs that to be good. It needs to really convey some sort of really strong emotion, which I feel like this I mean, definitely pulls off. Um, in your questions, I asked you, and this is not something that's directly stated in the poem, I asked you what's the biggest mistake people make when dealing with the speaker. And remember, the speaker is the person who is talking in the poem. The biggest mistake made when you talk about a speaker is for people to assume automatically that the author is the speaker. Not always the case. There's plenty of songs that are written from the perspective of other people. And just because the singer's singing, you can't automatically assume that's him, that's his feelings. We do know this is Ben Johnson, though, because he even mentions his name. He includes that in line 10. So that's a for sure. But you, you got to be careful and not automatically assume speaker is the author, okay? All right, so now let's look at the next one, which this one's a lot more lighthearted. And we're on page 498. We have Still to be Neat. And this is two stanzas. Uh, it's 12 lines again. I'm going to read stanza one, talk about it, and then read stanza two, okay? It says, Still to be neat, still to be dressed as you were going to a feast. Still to be powdered, still perfumed. Lady, is it to be presumed? Though art's hit causes are not found, all is not sweet, all is not sound. So right away we have this image of this woman who's dressed to the nines, man. She is... Uh, you know, got her best dress on. She's got all her makeup on. She's got her hair done up nice. And, uh, you know, he's noting a level of there's the, the, of pretentiousness. This is not normal. This isn't who you really are. It's the idea that you have presented yourself to be something that's really not you. Because, you know, minus the fancy dress, minus the nice hair, minus the makeup and all these things, this isn't who you are. He also suggests, you know, he says all is not sweet, all is not sound, saying there's something's up. You know, you're trying to mask something about yourself. For some reason, you don't think you're you're good enough. You're not pretty enough or whatever, and you're using all of this to hide. Now, he's not saying that that's the case every time, so don't anybody get their feelings hurt. He's saying, notice, though, as you were going to a feast. It's like you're not going. If you're going to a place somewhere fancy, all of that is is required or even expected, but expected, maybe even required. But for just the average everyday person, that's not the case is, is kind of what he's saying. So he feels like this person's missing something. There's something that's empty with them. Okay, so second stanza we get, Give me a look, give me a face that makes simplicity a grace. Robes loosely flowing, hair is free, such sweet neglect more taketh me than all the adulteries of art. They strike mine eyes, but not my heart. And he points here that he would prefer a woman who is more natural, more, you know, this is who I am. I'm not trying to fake being something else. You know, he, he's valuing this sense of, of genuineness that is lacking. Of course, this is really relevant today because so few of us are actually who we, you know, we don't present ourselves as we actually are. We mask it behind. A, it Maybe it's physical stuff like clothing or makeup, but it could be other things between like how we talk and, you know, the attitudes we use. A lot of that is masking who we really are because we're really just not happy with who we are. But he points out, he says, they strike mine eyes, but not my heart. He's saying that, yes, I find a, a well-dressed woman who's got all her makeup on very attractive, but that doesn't reach my heart. My heart is re reached by, um, you know, a person who shows me who they really are and a, and a genuine attachment to who they are, not how they look. So really pretty, really, really um, ap applicable poem to us today for sure, okay? All right, so now let's hit this third one, which is a bit of a problem. Now, this is not one I typically teach. Um I taught it again this year because, one, I needed something to fill the space. I mean, two of these poems is, is a 15-minute lesson, really. Um, that's on a good day. So, so I wanted to add in this third one, but this third one has something interesting to me in the second stanza, which may or may not be there, but um, I feel like it is. So uh, let's look at the first stanza because this one's a little longer. This one's a 16-line poem. Um, but let's look at the first stanza. I believe it's broken into two octaves, so two eight-line set, eight sets. A very famous first couple of lines. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Or leave a kiss but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine. But my eye of Jove's nectar sup, I would not change for thine. Okay, right away we get this image of you know this deep, 
love uh, or maybe obsession with another person. The, the speaker is saying, when he says, drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge with mine, this idea of these two people just sitting there, you know, connecting on a level where they're just kind of staring into each other's eyes. A very romantic, although realistically creepy image, okay? And then he has this whole thing about drinking from a cup. Um, he even links it to the idea that if, you know, he wouldn't trade a cup that this girl had had put her lips on for a cup that had the nectar of the gods in it. So, you know, very extreme imagery of he loves this girl or at least is super obsessed with her, okay? Um, very common love poetry, eight lines here. There's nothing magnificently done here. These next eight, though, there's something that I'd missed the first two times I've looked at this. I thought it was just a basic love poem. Um as I said, the late a rosy wreath, not so much honoring thee as giving it a hope that there it could not withered be. But thou thereon didst only breathe and sentest it back to me, since when it grows and smells, I swear not of itself but thee. So now he's pointing out how he sent her some flowers and, you know, the image that these flowers wouldn't even die because, you know, her presence is so wonderful and beautiful that even these flowers couldn't die in it, which, again, that fits with the first eight lines. But did you catch what happens in the last four? And if I, I may be just attaching 21st century thinking to a poem that's from the 17th. But, you know, when he says that she sent them back, that is, girls don't send back flowers to people they love. All right. Now, it's not even people that they're just like, oh, that was nice of him. She like to send flowers back is a deliberate action, in my opinion, to tell somebody you're not interested. And in, like I've told you before, I'm not interested. So she sends them back, and then he says, I swear they smell like you, not themselves now. And now, when if you take what I said about the flowers being sent back, this becomes very creepy. Uh, and it may not have been intentionally done that way. I'm, I'm looking at the questions here at the bottom, um, and it doesn't really draw much attention to that. But the fact that the flowers are sent back is a problem for me. Okay, So, you know, there may be some experts out there who've read this and been like, that's definitely not it. He's just talking about, you know, uh, she sent them back as like a, uh, just like he sent them to her. She turned around and sent them back, indicating she loves him too. Maybe that's something they did in that time period. I don't know. But um, it definitely, uh, your book asks about if it's artificial or, or, or fake kind of love. And there's definitely a tinge of that throughout this poem. And to the point, even where the girl's not interested in this guy is still obsessed. And it becomes a little bit creepy. One of the things you'll notice about me is, Love poetry from this time period, I find to be quite uh, bland and plastic. It just feels like it's the same old stuff. And there, there's a reason. It's been replicated so many times by people. It's really not these authors' faults. But really, this is the case with a lot of things we consider romantic. When you really analyze romantic gestures, they're only romantic if both people are into each other. Because if one isn't, that romantic gesture now becomes stalkerish in a lot of ways, depending, especially how dramatic and how grand a gesture you may make. So, um, this, like I said, the third poem I may be I may be off on. I may be misinterpreting it, but uh, you know, I feel like it makes it more interesting if you take my interpretation for sure than if you just made it a basic love poem. So, anyway, that closes our section on Ben Jonathan. Um, we are going to move into some Carpe Diem poetry next. The two very famous poems dealing with that. Um, to the virgins to make much of time and to his coy mistress, I believe is the titles. We're going to be tackling those uh, next, and uh, those are fun to talk about. So they're longer, but I think they're they're um, they're more interesting in some ways. So we're going to get to those next. Thank you for bearing with me, and as for these first two sections of the unit, John Dunn and Ben Johnson are not most of my students' favorite things to discuss, but um, I do think that they're they're brilliant. I think that the writing is strong, and I think historically they have so much value. And uh, there's nothing wrong with reading a little bit of poetry, okay? All right, guys. Well, that will do it for me. So I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening whenever you may be viewing this. And I can't wait to see you again to talk about some of my favorite thing, which is the fact that I cannot stand the concept of carpe diem ideology. So let's get ready to bust up something that I, it seemed to be a beautiful and amazing thing. And let me just gripe about it. That's more to come. All right, guys. Well, have a excellent, excellent evening.